Today I have the privilege of bringing the Word of God to you and opening up the book of James as we continue our study. So I invite you to open your your Bibles to James chapter 4 as we continue walking through this aspect of the Christian life which is overwhelmingly practical. It's very, very easy to theologize these different elements of the Christian life. It's very, very easy to bring them up to this lofty level that is so far removed from the day-to-day and the practical and the way that we uh, interact with the world around us and the people that God sends our way and the way that we practice our worship and the way that we live our lives that we tend to forget the fact that faith without works is dead. And that were we not to be those who actively live out our faith in measurable ways, were we not to be those who live in such a way as to show that I actually believe these things, then what does that faith actually do? And so today we get to look at this rather large question of what does it mean when we talk about a God who is sovereign? What what does it mean when we talk about a God who is truly in control And I've titled today's sermon, How Sure Are You About Tomorrow? Friends, I want to invite you to stand as we read the Word of God together. We'll be reading James chapter 4, beginning from verse 13. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him It is sin. Father, I ask that you would speak to us today, perhaps in a way that we've never heard you speak before. Father, soften our hearts, open our minds, remove our egos as we interact with the word and the eternal truth of an all-powerful, all-beautiful, all-merciful God who has communicated to us in his grace and in his love toward us. Amen. Have a seat, friends. Friend, I want to ask you today as we interact with this text, do you love the doctrine of the sovereignty of God? Or is this a doctrine that you've merely learned to put up with? You hear these testimonies often of when people come to faith, when they come to saving faith, and they hear about this doctrine of a sovereign God who does everything in accordance with his own divine will, that this is something that's difficult for that person to wrestle with. This is something that's difficult for that person to deal with. And so I want to ask you, have you just begrudgingly accepted this doctrine, or have you come to love this aspect of the God who you serve? What do you think of when you think of God, the Sovereign One, the one who is totally and perfectly in control of all things, not some things, not most things, not sort of kind of in control, not working things along and then just sort of letting them go out of that, but totally and completely and perfectly, overwhelmingly, comprehensively in control of every single thing that comes to pass or doesn't? Are we actually capable of humbling ourselves under that kind of sovereignty? What does it mean to humble yourself under that kind of sovereignty? Not a philosophical sovereignty of a God who is powerful, a sovereignty of a God who is totally in control. At the core of not being able to submit to God's will, at the core of wrestling with this kind of sovereignty, at the core of not being able to trust a God like this is pride. It's the pride that says, I know what I'm doing. I know how to run my life. I know what needs to happen next. 
I've planned, I've thought through, I've written out, I've researched, I've talked to people, I know what I'm doing, and here's how it will all unfold. None of us would say it quite like that, but when we approach the pursuit of spouse, job, house, car, spending my time going on my vacation, dressing my children, do we actually stop to think about a God who is perfectly and divinely in control? Or is that the point at which we would then take the reins and say, sovereignty, sure, but I got to do some stuff? Of course, none of us would say that we're in opposition, but man, we sure do live like it at times, don't we? Now, this text hits home for me a lot. Um, Vitaly and I were talking, and he, he asked me to preach on this text, uh, and I kind of glanced over it, and I was like, okay, yeah, I, I'd love to, and I took a little bit of time. Some of you know what Kaita and I are kind of in the middle of right now. Uh, we are currently two weeks out from going to Belarus for a month, where this will be kind of the last of our extended trips prior to finalizing all of the things necessary for the move. And in that process, we are trying to sell a house, hopefully make a profit. We're trying to sell a house. Uh, I, I'm working full time. We're trying to figure out a bunch of details. We're trying to plan a move. We're trying to look through all of the details pertaining to that. And so when I'm processing all of this information, I'm thinking about going into such and such a place and making a profit. And I'm thinking about making the right decision in regard to my life and my family. And I'm thinking about taking the necessary steps to make sure that the thing that I'm doing and the way that I do it is the best way possible. And I'll tell you this, when I read this text, it was like an arrow through my heart because I realized I don't trust God in this process very much. I talk as if I do, I throw out the Christian tropes and general statements pretty easily and pretty regularly about trusting God and about prayer, but when it comes down to the reality of the situation, and my house has been on the market for two weeks in a market that homes apparently sell for in three minutes for everybody else, and I still haven't had an offer, I'm really starting to wonder, what do I need to do? How do I finagle the situation to make it work in my way and make a buck so that I can go to such and such a place? And with this text, what God has shown me is, Andre, you don't trust me. Andre, you don't believe that I oversee economies and housing markets and international moves. I send buyers and I take them away. I make things happen or I don't. And I will send you where I need you to go when I need you to go there. Not a moment sooner, not a moment later. That's a hard pill to swallow, friends. But what a beautiful medicine it is when we actually believe it. In order to communicate this truth about trusting in God's leading and seeking His will, our brother James has given us an example. And he's trying to show us what does this actually look like in practice. And he's given us this example, and in this example, he takes this group of people that are going about life seemingly doing rather ordinary, rather good things, and he reprimands them for the way that they do it. What does he reprimand them for exactly? For saying that they'll tra take a trip to a certain destination? For saying that they'll spend some time there, engage in business, and make some money? What's the issue with that? Why is that a problematic thing? Why is that worthy of reprimand? In essence, what's wrong with these people, as James points out to us, is that they've made plans without expressing an accurate view of their lives and an accurate view of God. And so if the problem is not with what's being done or what's being planned to be done, but rather a true or an accurate view of God, our immediate question when interacting with something like this should be, well, what is that view? And so I want to look at that to our text and I want to unpack that question. 
I want to unpack that truth and so we could take a look at who we are, why trusting in our own plans is wrong, and what we can truly rely on in light of who God is and who we are and how we are to look at the life that we are going through. The first point I wanted us to take a look at, I've titled, Ignorant, Frail, and Dependent. Get that on a t-shirt and wear it around town. Ignorant, frail, and dependent. Read with me verses 14 and 15 once more. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. These two verses show us something extraordinary about life and about God. Your excessive planning, my dear brother or sister, can fail to take into account or give expression to a true view of life. Do you think about that as you approach life with diligence and you unpack every detail pertaining to the decision that you're about to make? Your excessive planning can actually fail to take into account a true view of God. This is where we would often respond, okay, yeah, so what? I'm a vapor, but I'm still going to do X, Y, or Z. Yeah, life is fleeting. I get that. I could die tomorrow. All right, but I still need to think about this or that. I have stuff to do. I have goals. I have aspirations. Well, guess what? It matters to God how you do that. It matters to God how you approach life. It matters to God how you think about the decision that you're making. It matters to God how you plan. It matters to God how you do the wise thing you may be doing. It matters to God. God wants to be in the process of your planning. God wants you to believe the truth that He's communicated about Himself in His Word. And so the question that you should regularly be asking yourself as you're making these decisions and as you're processing these things is, does my mindset align with what he's revealed in his word about himself and about me. It seems to matter to God what we think and what we say, not only what we do. And we see this all throughout scripture, friends. The mind is a powerful thing and your hands can do things that are well beyond what God has asked you to do. You, you can cross lines and you can uh, assume or presume things upon God. And so the things that we say, the things that we think, the way that we conduct ourselves beyond the obvious and beyond the measurable to other people matters. And we see this most specifically in the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus is talking about the heart being the overwhelming thing that determines how you are going about life, whether or not you are doing things that honor God and that serve the people around you or whether you're just doing things for the sake of doing them and looking good in front of others. Does your mind function in accordance with a true view of life? Moreover, do your words support that view? Is that worldview just locked away somewhere in your mind, far away from prying eyes and prying ears? Or do the words that you speak, the way that you communicate about life, the way that you look at what happens around you, good or bad, communicate that you actually align with God's worldview? This thought should then push us just a little deeper, just a little bit deeper into the mind of God. And we should ask, why would it matter what I think about what I do? Why would it matter what I vocalize about what I do? Shouldn't my actions just speak for themselves? Especially as it pertains to everyday trivial things like making a couple bucks or setting a goal for my future. Because God created you my dear brother and sister, for more than just a plan for a future career, for more than just a plan for a housing situation, for more than just investments in retirement, God wants more out of you, something far more meaningful and far more eternally significant than a house or a couple bucks. These things are not what life is mainly about. Life is about truth. And we serve a God of truth. 
thinking what God thinks, feeling what God feels, loving what God loves, if our minds and our actions and our words and our intentions and our goals aren't aligned with the mind of God and pursuing His will and His purposes, then we might as well just give up this whole Christianity game because that's not what life's about. We don't show up to church on Sunday morning and sit and listen to a man talk for an hour and then go about our lives as if this God doesn't even exist or care about the way that I spend my money and the way that I plan my future. If we remove ourselves from the will of God and the thoughts of God pertaining to all of this life, then what are we even doing here? This is religion in the most trivial, boring way possible if our hearts are not aligned with the heart of God, if our minds are not aligned with the mind of God. This is a dead faith. It matters that the truth of God drives everything that we do. It matters. James seems to be quite upset He's using a tone that shows he's unhappy with these people who are just doing normal, everyday, run-of-the-mill things just because they haven't stopped to express a true view of life and a complete dependence on God. That's enough to put them in the wrong with what they're doing with their lives. He sees this as a serious problem. And by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit for this writer of the Word of God, God wanted to communicate that this is a serious problem. This has to do with the fact that we are holy and totally dependent on God. Whether or not we say that, we are totally and wholly dependent on God. If God chooses to take your life away this very second, you're gone. If God chooses to take the breath out of your lungs, you won't even take the necessary couple of minutes to dwindle out of this life. You will cease to exist. To not recognize that is clear opposition to the God who created you and who upholds you. This has to do with that. Does your life contain Not only a belief in the back of your mind, but a verbal expression about who God is and what He does. The right view of life is that you are but a vapor. Have you ever watched a vapor as you step outside into the cold and you breathe and you watch it disappear right before your eyes? You are but a vapor. The right view of God is that you will only do something if the Lord wills it. God is in total control of all life, and God is in total control of every single life and of that life's death. If the Lord wills it, you live. If the Lord doesn't will it, you die. Do you ever think about that? Do you ever stop and think about the fact that I'm only alive I'm only breathing this very breath because the Lord has willed it. You can't live apart from that. You can't exist apart from that. It is only because the Lord wills it that you are here listening to these words right now. If the Lord didn't will it, you wouldn't be here. When we say, Lord willing this, or if the Lord wills that, do we actually mean that? Do we stop and think about what that, what that actually means? Do you ever think about the fact that if the Lord didn't will it, your life and your plans and everything else would unfold in an entirely different way? God means for you to know that, to live within that reality. Not because he's some control freak, not because he needs to commandeer your whole life, not because he needs to manage every single little aspect because he's so obsessive, because he is good and because he knows the best thing possible. He has created you, he has given you life and breath, he has created this whole world to function in such a way as to bring glory to himself through his son, Jesus Christ, whom he sent into the world to save sinners like me and you, who are sitting here breathing and are thinking, you know what, I think I need to make a couple bucks and not even giving a second thought to the God who gave you the ability to make that buck and to think that thought about the money. That's why it matters. 
God means for the truth of His sovereign rule over my life and over your life to be spoken of, to be thought of, to be believed, to be internalized. Friend, you only get home today after church if God wills it. Amen? Let's live like that. Let's not take things for granted assuming that I'm the captain of my own ship. Let's stop fooling ourselves and living in that delusion and understanding that when I take a step and I don't trip and fall and die, that that's the grace of God. And when you live like that, everything changes. Everything changes. What's a buck when God is upholding my very existence? What is this life when I'm just a vapor and people need to hear about Jesus Christ because I might be gone in three seconds? Friend, you only have food to eat if He provides it. You only have clothes to wear if He gives it to you. None of these things are a given. You didn't earn it. If you have the money to buy these things, If you have access to them, it's not because you're better than the people that don't. It's because God has allowed for that and He's chosen to give you that access and those opportunities and the strength to do it and the mind to earn that money. Live like that. Think like that. Believe that. Not only is God in total control of life and death, but look at the verse. If He wills, we live and we do this or that. God governs the doing of this or that. God governs your successes. God governs your accomplishments. God governs whether or not you sell your house. God governs whether or not you get that job. Do we obsess when things don't go my way, but God, this is good, why? Because God didn't will it. Do I trust Him? Do I believe Him? Do I take Him at His word? Or is this just a book with some religious stuff that sounds nice on a Sunday morning? Our ignorance pertaining to this point is seen in the fact that we just do not know what tomorrow will bring or whether or not I'll have a tomorrow. You can eat all the organic food you want. You can exercise 23 hours a day, actually, you know, 20, 16 hours a day, and then sleep a solid eight hours. You can do all that stuff. You can plan out your life in the best way possible. But if God so chooses, you die in your sleep. And then tomorrow is not here. And in that sense, we're ignorant. We're frail, or our frailty is seen in the fact that our lives are fleeting. Here today, gone tomorrow, insignificant in terms of compared to eternity. What's 70 years? Okay, 90 years. 100 years up against eternity. And our dependency is seen in the fact that whatever may come or, or, or may come to pass in our lives will only come to pass by the hand of God who works all things for our good and for His glory, not a single element of that being out of His control. Now, being in opposition to that my dear friends, James says is arrogant and it is rebellious. That brings us to our second point. Take a look at verses 16 and 17. As it is, you boast in your arrogance, all such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it for him, it is sin. These two things, these two words that we see, arrogant as we see in verse 16, and rebellious or sinful as we see in verse 17, these are not exaggerations. This is not James just doing wordplay to grab your attention and to hold on. This is, this is the reality. This is the picture that the Word of God gives us about this situation. We demonstrate who we trust by what we say and what we do. Thus, the rebuke in these verses, this warning from James, is very, very timely. What's wrong with how these people in our passage conducted themselves? They failed to acknowledge that they are nothing but a vapor and that God is in total control of everything. They thought that in their planning, they can accomplish, and uh, that accomplishment will come to pass. That, That goal, that plan will come to pass. And it never entered these people's minds that they, as people, as entities of this planet, are on their way out. They failed to think about, what's money to a vapor? It never entered their minds that their plans may not work out. It never entered their minds that God may not have willed it. All that I accomplish in this life, 
All that I fail to accomplish in this life is governed by God. God runs everything, and nothing will happen unless he wills it. Keep that in mind. And beyond keeping that in mind, speak that to the people around you. Live your life as if you believe that. And when you make a plan, and when you go through life actually processing what's going on around you, thinking about the future, live in accordance with that. We can speak these things. We can say the good stuff without actually believing it. We modern-day Christians, we're very fluent in Christianese. And we can very easily say, by the will of God, or if the Lord wills it, without actually believing that. And James tells us this is arrogance. Because we don't see ourselves as we are when we live like that. And we don't see God as He is. And failing to recognize that we really have very little control over what happens in this life apart from the will and the work of God, what can we really do? A confidence in tomorrow dismisses the fact that we are ignorant of tomorrow, of what tomorrow may or may not bring. We are frail and we are fleeting and we are totally dependent on this God. Living in accordance with that confidence, moving forward or motivated by it, James says, is sin. That's rebellion against God. That's me standing up and puffing my chest out and telling God that I know better than he does. Boasting in what you do not have and finding comfort in that thing or the prospect of that thing is evil in the eyes of the Lord. Being silent about your reliance on God and not confessing the supremacy of his will and the perfection of that will is sin in the eyes of the Lord. Moving about life without confessing who God is, shows that we've forgotten about Him. This is not a mere oversight, friend. This is an intentional moving through life saying, Sovereign? I know a sovereign. It's Andre. Because this guy makes the decisions about his whole life. This guy sets his own plans. That's a rebellion against the God who created you and who upholds you and who gives you the day and the brain to think that thought. So instead of arrogance and rebellion, my dear friends, let's consider the fact that we are lovingly led and that we are generously provided for. And that brings us to our final point. It's not just that God wants us to practice rote memorization of a variety of different doctrines. It's not just that God wants us to be well-versed in the, the realities of sovereignty and the will of God and, and really, really understand what it means that God is in control. It's not just that God wants us to be well-versed in the things that might actually push back against the normal things in this world and the things that the, the world lives by. These things are all but an effect of the realities of who God is. This truth about God actually communicates something on a much, much deeper level for us, and that is that God is showing us here how he relates to us and how we relate to him. It's not just about believing the right thing and saying the right thing at the right time. This reality that's encapsulated in these verses here is what God does for you as your heavenly Father. And this is the reality of how He expects you in turn to relate to Him. What should drive your worship? What should drive your prayer life? What should drive your love of the Word of God and the people of God and the ministry of the saints in the context of the body of Christ? He leads us in love, friends. He's not just a dictator that's commandeering everything just because he wants to. He leads us in love. He leads you with patience. If you've been a believer for longer than a day, you've already come to know, I'm sure, that God is very patient with us. He leads us gently. He leads us kindly. How much more perfectly is the scene in that he called us to himself when we were in opposition to him? And in His Son, Jesus Christ, He gave us hope not only for this life, but for the life to come. He raised us from the dead. He brought us back. And He drew us to Himself. If that's not a loving and a generous and a gracious God, I don't know what is. He made enemies into sons and daughters. 
The thing is, God being perfectly in control is the best possible place we could find ourselves. If not him, then who or what? Me? Chance? Other people? What are our options? If not God being perfectly and divinely in control, if not God leading my life, if I'm left to my own devices, if, I, if God ceases to, to rule and to reign in my life, and it's just me making those decisions, or it's just the people around me, or it's just the circumstances of the day, I'm doomed. The Father who loves you is caring for you presently and is leading you where he desires you to be. Think about that. Has he ever let you down? Now I'm sure each of you right now is running through a whole catalog of memories and a whole catalog of things that have happened in your life where things don't make sense, where things don't add up, where things are exceedingly painful, where a pill is particularly difficult to swallow. And each of you is running through that very thing and you're trying to process and you're trying to fit it in. And the fact of the matter is, in, in, uh, specifically pertaining to that very thing that you're thinking about that you can't fit in, guess what? Each of us has that because we are not God and we can't fit all of the circumstances of our life from day one to day whatever and make them make sense about why things flow in the way they do and why things fit in in the way that they do. But this heavenly father who has called you to himself and who calls you son and who calls you daughter and who loves you and who cares for you, he knows and he won't let you down. This frees us up if we actually believe that and if we live in accordance with that. This frees us up in such a way as to actually take risks for God, to not feel like we need to plan every minute detail out and totally commandeer our own lives. Friend, do you take risks? I know that that seems taboo in a culture where everything needs to be detailed out and thought out, but friend, do you take risks? Are you capable of relinquishing control and following where God may lead? Do you ever sense, seek to gain a sense of the leading of the Spirit, this helper that Jesus said is more advantageous for us to have than if he was walking right by your side giving you advice? Do you seek to gain a sense of the leading of the Spirit and where He is leading and how He is leading? Or does everything need to be a checklist in your life where every single detail is so perfectly orchestrated that there's no room for God to swipe the slate clean, uh, swipe the slate clean and lead you in a totally different direction? We are in the Lord's hands and only what He wills will come to pass? Do you live in such a way as to hold everything as tightly as you can? Does carefulness define the way that you function more than a trust in God? Do you ever follow God in a direction that may seem a little bit scary? Or is everything just very perfectly predictable by now in your Christian life? Planning for tomorrow and being diligent is good. I'm not saying stop planning, stop thinking, stop looking to the next day, stop looking to the next year. Planning and thinking through the processes are, are, of, of this life and being diligent in the things that the Lord has entrusted to you, that's good. That's commended in Scripture. We are called not to be slothful. We're called not to be unwise. We're called to be diligent and work hard and do all of these things. But we're also in danger of being so methodical and so overly thorough that we miss where God is leading and we don't hear how He's speaking to us. Friends, I am confident by looking at my own life and by interacting with a lot of Christians over the years that we have forgotten to listen to the way that God speaks to us. God speaks primarily and predominantly through his word, but we have the spirit in us as a gift to lead us in the way that we will go. Are we listening? Or is that not one of the items on our checklist? The thing is, when we see that we are but a vapor, and we see that the God who rules and reigns completely has called us to himself, has brought us into his plan, has enlisted us into the most beautiful thing that has ever worked out in the history of this planet, in the history of the cosmos, in the history of everything. He's brought us into that plan. 
If we believe that, if we know that, if we live in accordance with that, then we can boldly live out our lives totally for him. And we're glad to sacrifice and to trust and to follow where he leads, even if it doesn't really make sense and even if it's absolutely terrifying because it crumbles all of the plans that I've built up for my own life. Are you willing to go? Are you willing to listen? Are you willing to undo those plans if God so chooses? This truth about a God who leads and who reigns and who rules and who is intimately involved in your life in every single way possible, this is a truth to be enjoyed. My friend, Enjoy this omnipotent, all-knowing, all-powerful God who is eternally beautiful, who is eternally wise, and who knows much better than you or I what we need to be doing. This is a truth to be enjoyed. This God loves you. This God is leading you. You are secure. He has purchased you, and He now sovereignly flows through the whole of your life, through every person He sends your way, through every circumstance that you go through, through everything that you feel, however painful, however pleasant, however certain, however unclear, your God is with you. So friend, how sure are you about tomorrow? Until tomorrow comes, trust in the one who is sure about tomorrow and believe that he knows what's best and allow for him to care for you in the way that only he can. You won't do better than the God who created you and who loves you. Friends, let me give us a moment in the quiet of our hearts to bow down before God. If you're able to kneel, kneel. If you'd like to stand, stand. If you'd like to stay seated, please do. But come before God and talk to your Heavenly Father. You don't need to think about the formality of how do you communicate in prayer. Talk to Him. If you're here and you've never talked to God in an open and honest way, now's the time. Talk to God. Repent where needed. Ask for his leading. Ask for him to open your heart. Ask for him to open your mind. Ask for him to open your eyes. And honestly ask him to do with your life what he wills. Now that's a scary thing to ask because that may well be the exact opposite of what you will. But if you're willing to do what God has called you to do and if you're willing to follow where God is leading... That's a life worth living. I'm going to give you just a moment to pray and then I'll close. Our great God, we come humbly before you, acknowledging our total dependence on you. Lord, we are nothing without you. We can do nothing without you. Our plans, if not aligned with your will, are a mockery to the God who created us. And yet, although we are ignorant, frail, so deeply dependent, 
Father, you've told us that you love us. And you've called us into your fellowship. You've given us life and hope. You've given us a purpose. And you've given us a righteousness that were we to live a million lifetimes we could never attain, the righteousness of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for being our God. Thank you for allowing us to call you Father. And thank you for this amazing truth that shows us that our life is perfectly safe in your hand. Lord, help us live in accordance with that reality. Help us not fight against it. Help us see the beauty of the way that you work all things for our good and for your glory. And in the pursuit of a life that looks like that, may we bring glory to the name of Jesus through whom it is possible to even pray this prayer and know that you hear us. Father, use us, use Word of Grace Bible Church, use every single Christian here to make this Jesus known to our community, to our state, to our country, and wherever you will call us to be. Father, if there's somebody here listening to this sermon and they're fighting against a sovereign God like the one of whom we've just heard, Lord, I plead with you to soften their heart. I plead with you to land the truth of the Savior who's come to pursue sinners just like them. Make that truth beautiful to their ears this very moment. Lord, bless us as we seek to be a body that is faithful to the things to which you've called us. And may Jesus be glorified here and through each of us. We ask in his name. Amen.